hearing from Kat Spengros. Kat is the Director of Development for SAY, which stands for Social Advocates for Youth. She was born in Michigan and attended Baldwin Wallace University in Cleveland for her undergraduate degree. She also attended classes at SRJC before earning her MBA in 2011 from Dominican University in San Rafael. Prior to SAY, she managed operations and grants at the Committee of on the Shelter List in Petaluma and served as a United States as a United States Peace Corps um, volunteer in Armenia, where she opened the country's first domestic violence shelter. Welcome, Kat. Thank you, Kayla. So I'm Kat, and if we had more time, we'd go around and get to know every one of you, but really it's all about me today. Um, actually, I do need help. Can I get someone who's maybe sitting in the middle here to be my timekeeper? Really? Sure. It's not that, okay, thank you. I'm like, it's not that hard. Can you tell me, how long do I have? 45. 45, 45 minutes, so in 35 minutes, like, wave your arms around, make it known. Um, otherwise, we'll be here afternoon. All right. Well, I think Kayla did a great job introducing me. So that's me. And um, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm honored that Alvin in, in, uh, invited me to come, and thank you for spending your lunch hour with me. I see some of you munching. I'm jealous. Um, so for the next 45 minutes, what I'm going to be talking about is change-making and leadership. And I'm actually going to cover something that was in your chapter. How many of you read the chapter? Don't look. Okay, that is way better than last year, let me just say. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think the first thing, though, that I want to do is get, um, I need two volunteers, and this is a public speaking volunteer opportunity. You will speak for one minute. So I need two. Lady in the black and white stripes there, come on up. One more, one more. This is a room of 200 people. I can get one more volunteer, right? I got a laugher here. Come on up in the hat. Okay, great. So come up on stage. So Kayla mentioned one of the things that I did, yeah, come on up, I'm just stalling while you guys get up here. One of the things that I did um, about 10 years ago was serve in the United States Peace Corps. And one of the things that um, I noticed when I first got there was um, that a lot of the bathrooms looked, well shoot, I don't know what I'm doing, looked like that, um, right there in the center with, the, with the, the rocks holding down the roof, that was my family's toilet. And I thought, oh my gosh, if I'm going to do anything in this community, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help them get running water because <laughs> clearly they need it. So what I'm going to ask you two to do, and what are your names? I'm Mariah. Mariah. Thank you, Mariah. And what's your name? Joshua. Joshua. Let's give Mariah and Joshua a round of applause. Because <laughs> they have no idea what they're about to do. So Mariah and Joshua, what I'm going to tell you is a little bit of background information, and then um, we're going to have a contest to see which one of you can talk this room into doing the thing that you're going to try to get them to do, okay? okay? What I want you to try to imagine is that this is a room full of Armenians. Is anyone actually Armenian? Okay, well, then you can pretend that you're from a little country in the mountains, in the Caucasus. And um, so these Armenians live in a village with no running water. Uh, they have sporadic electricity, so probably none of you have bathed today, um, and maybe that's actually true. Um, <laughs> uh, so you probably all help grow your own food, and you can it, so you have something to eat in the wintertime because there are no stores in your village. You probably have never seen a real doctor unless you've had something really, really bad happen, and if that happened, then maybe you wouldn't have survived it. You live way out in the middle of nowhere, and there isn't regular transportation to your village, okay? <laughs> So that's who you're talking to. And you two are me, this American girl in her early 20s who decides to save the world. And after learning all of that about your, your new neighbors, your job is to try to talk them into getting running water and why it would be helpful. And these are the things you've noticed. A lot of people tend to get sick. Maybe they get diarrhea. You've noticed a lot of your, your American friends getting diarrhea because the water has some creepy crawlies in it that are no good for you. You've also noticed that the little kids, they don't drink water at school because there are no toilets at school because there's no running water. So the little kids at school don't drink water because they don't want to have to use a thing that's not there. So these are a couple things you've noticed. You've been there maybe three weeks, and your English is great, but your Armenian 
is spotty. So for today, you're going to do this in English. But pretend that you get to talk to this group of people about why the project you want to work on as a Peace Corps volunteer is to get them running water, OK? Yeah. OK. You're taller, Joshua. You get to go first. Yeah, you get one minute. You're going to talk this group of people into why they should get behind you and getting running water in this community. Come on, let's do this. Sell them and go. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I come from a small village, and I've only been here for three weeks. And I don't know if you know how long three weeks is, but three weeks is, you know, a pretty long amount of time if you've been away from your family or whatever the case may be. So since I've been here, I've noticed that people don't have, you know, we don't have running water. We don't have any of that. People are struggling. People don't have food. People don't have all of these things. You know, there's kids that have, like, diseases and stuff like that. And, you know, we can't give them the medical aid that they need, so what do we do? Put yourself in their shoes. Imagine that we have a family, and we have all of these things, and we can't get them the support that they need, but we know that they're struggling. How would you feel? 10 seconds. We need to get them running water. <laughs> Any closing statement? Put yourself in their shoes and just give back and help them to get <laughs> to get the blessings that you need to receive. Excellent. Excellent, Joshua. That was great. That was great. I, I asked you to do a crazy thing. You did a good job. All right, so Mariah got to see him do it and learn. Let's see if she does any better. And go. All right, now I've only been here for three weeks, and I'm very sorry if this is overstepping my boundaries, if I'm intruding at all, but I've been able to watch, I've been able to observe, and I've noticed that there's a big issue at hand that we all need to identify, and it's the fact that you guys are not having the right amounts of water, the clean water that you guys need. Um, Alvin, you have a child, right? Mm -hmm. is, is that your, Alvin? Okay. Yeah. He has a child. <laughs> His child is going by, he has five children. Those four, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five little babies can't go pee pee at school. They can't, they can't drink the water when they're thirsty from working on those math solutions because you guys don't, don't have the funds. And I think that it's very important. In America, we grow organic foods just like you guys can with the right amount of water, and we sell them for a million dollars. You guys can make your stocks go up. You guys can raise money. You guys can do this. You guys Ten seconds. need to commit. You guys want your kids to go pee pee, right? <laughs> Time. So many lives. Excellent, excellent. Okay, I'm going to let you two sit down. You both did an outstanding job. Let's give a round of applause for Joshua and Mariah. That was fun. Um, so I want to applaud both of them because both of them brought up right away something that I think is really important. They both said, I've only been here three weeks. They acknowledged right away that I only have this amount of experience compared to your lifetime of experience. And I think that was really important. And I don't think I've ever had anybody who's gotten up and do this actually lead with that. So that's a great job. Um, the other thing that Joshua did that I thought was really important was he led with the needs. He said, there's disease. You guys aren't getting enough food and water. Like, those are basics. And that's really important to point out. And Mariah, I really liked how in addition to saying, I've only been here three weeks, she said, I have observed this. I have seen it. Just a testament to her seeing it and acknowledging that she's seen it around her and with this community she's talking to. Then she connected with um, the five poor children who need to go pee pee. I mean, that was great. Um, so both of you did a great job. Now here's the, here's the deal. This actually was so real. So I got to Peace Corps and it was about three weeks in and I'm like, I know what I need to do to make a difference. And I felt really good about it. And because I was an idealist and I thought I just would be able to go in and help. And the problem is that nobody wants your help <laughs> if they don't trust you. And after talking to these women, it became clear to me, um, the women that I worked with, that this wasn't a huge deal to them. <coughs> I had observed diarrhea among my Ar American friends. I really hadn't seen it among the Armenians. And I hadn't made that connection. Oh, we're getting sick. Because our poor, delicate tummies can't handle the bacteria in the water. 
And then I talked to the ladies who worked in the village. You know, they carried water from the river up to their homes. Or there was a central spigot. I was lucky enough to live near a spigot that I would fill with, that I would fill my buckets with, carry that to where I lived, and I did my laundry by hand for two years. So you all have no excuses, I'm just saying. Um, but the women told me they actually liked that opportunity to go with their girlfriends down to the river and fill their buckets with water, or go to the spigot and hang out. Because it was kind of like the one time where they weren't cleaning their house, or taking care of their kids, or feeding their husband, or doing all that stuff. They got a little break, and it was sanctioned. It was allowed. And those were things I didn't really think of. And so the more I heard this, the more I realized running water isn't the biggest deal to them. And I, then I thought, well, well, what is? And I had no idea, because to me, running water was the biggest deal. Because as an American water hog, I like my shower every day, and I like to wash things with hot running water. And they didn't care about all that. So the Peace Corps taught me one thing right away, was that when you show up to go into a community, to help, this is what you look like. You look like Big Bird in the middle of Times Square saying, I'm here to help. Who in Times Square is going to take you up on that? It's kind of freaky. Like, you don't know why Big Bird's there, and these people didn't know why I was giving up two years of my life in America to come to this village. And so it began then a series of listening, and I spent about six months doing nothing. Sometimes the best thing you can do as a leader is nothing. And no one's going to tell you that, but I'm telling you right now, just stop and listen. And so I spent time listening. That's me in terrible glasses. But, um, but I spent time talking to my neighbors. And this was an old lady who she told me about her problems of moving around, how physically she couldn't get to the doctor. We went out to a village and learned that they weren't getting regular medical care because they didn't have access to it. And that was their biggest thing. I went to the local factory and learned about how their backs hurt because you can see that bench they're sitting on way far from ergonomic, right? I talked to Habitat for Humanity, an organization that's already there doing work. So if they already know stuff, why don't I learn from them instead of trying to reinvent the wheel? And then I discovered things from my students. So I taught over there quite a bit. And I learned about how they were aware of HIV, but didn't really understand it. And we did projects to teach about HIV. And this was a kind of a neat one. See the girl here? She has a red, uh, like red juice in her cup. And we, we taught them about how HIV is spread. Because over there, they thought it was kind of like, oh, you could sneeze and get it. Or you might touch someone who has it, and then you'd get it. And we taught them how, oh, it actually, it's about fluids transmitting. And so we actually got some fluids in cups, and we mixed that red, and, and we said, okay, you're at a party, okay? And everybody's cheersing, and you can't see what's, what is, what's in each other's cups, kind of like, you know, when you go to a party, you can't see what's in there. And um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so, um, so you cheers, and you, you exchange your fluids, and then before you know it, everybody's is pink. And that was helpful to show them how it was transmitted. Worked with um, the Red Cross. And again, they already had been there. So what did they know that I didn't? Because I didn't need to discover everything. And then, just like Mariah said, I observed. I saw litter on the countryside. I saw how they disposed of their cars in the rivers. And that's when things kind of shifted for me. It shifted from this being the most important thing to me learning about, OK, HIV, to me learning about how women really didn't sometimes feel safe at home in certain parts of town. And that six months of doing nothing was maddening because I wanted to do something. But after that six months passed, I actually was able to do something that mattered. And that was the difference. I could have just done something, or I could have done something that mattered. And in the end, I got to work with a group of amazing people to build a domestic violence shelter, and they've never had that there. I was able to work with folks to talk about HIV throughout the country and work at intervening it um, and helping avoid a further spread of that disease. There was a lot of great things that came out of that nothingness. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today, doing nothing. But now I'm going to bring it home. How many of you are familiar with social advocates for you? All right, you get a prize. You win the washer dryer combo. Okay, super. So social advocates for you, there's a 45-year-old nonprofit 
What is a nonprofit? Anyone? I can hear mumbling. No one's going to try to guess. You don't make no money. You don't make no money. Great. Lies, actually. Total lies. Last year we made $7 million. But the difference with a nonprofit, <laughs> I don't mean to be so hard on you. It was great for, you know, I shouldn't like attack. At least you, you, you said something. But actually, we, we do make money. It's just what we do with it. We don't pay taxes on it. Um, and so the difference between SAY and Apple, aside from the things that Apple makes and the things that SAY does, is one piece of paper. And that is called a 501c3 document. And that just means we don't make a profit. So we don't give that to our shareholders, for example, re reinvest that back into the organization to serve more youth. Um, and so if anybody ever tells you that, oh, a non it's just a nonprofit, that's why they're not together, that's actually a terrible excuse because a nonprofit should be just as good as a business. That's not my topic today, though. We'll come back to that maybe afterward. Um, so SAY is a nonprofit. We've been serving youth and families in this county for 45 years. And just a few numbers about us. Last year, we served over 4,700 young people. Over the past 45 years, we've served over 40,000. And we do three things, housing, counseling, and jobs. I want you to say it with me, housing, Counseling and jobs. One more time, I think we can do this. Housing, counseling, and jobs. Now, after you leave this place, people are gonna be like, what happened in there? And you're gonna be like, oh, a lady from Say Talk, they do housing, counseling, and jobs, okay? Um, so, we do that, um, we, we do that in a variety of ways. We have a teen shelter downtown. We have a drop-in center. We have counselor, uh, mental health clinicians that are placed in 28 schools throughout this county. We also work with young people who are going through grief. And we also help young people find jobs. That's one of our big things that we do. I can't get into all of that today because we're going to talk about leadership and change management. And the first thing I want to tell you is that if you want to take an, a community through a change and shift their culture, you have to listen to this man. Does anyone? Oh, man, that man. <laughs> That man is Rahm Emanuel. He's currently the mayor of Chicago. And he said this several years ago. He said, you never want a good crisis to go to waste. And that didn't mean to exploit it. What that means is if you find yourself in a terrible position, figure out what you can do to make sure it never happens again. So in San Francisco, uh, tonight, 853 young people aged 12 to 24 are going to be sleeping on the street. We think that number is fairly low, but we know that because that's how many we've counted. So 853 young people. So there's like maybe 200 people in here. So four of this room will be sleeping outside tonight in the city of San Francisco. Last year it was about 962. So things are looking up. And I can say the same about this county. How many young people do you think are going to sleep outside tonight in our county? Guess. 500, 200. Can I get another number? 600. What? 700. The closest was 700. Good job. Um, 678 young people tonight will sleep outside in our county. So just a little bit less than San Francisco. What do we know about the population of San Francisco and Sonoma County? Well, one is way bigger than the other, but our youth homeless population is very close. Wow. We hold a distinction in Santa Rosa. We have the number one rate of youth homelessness in the country per capita in our city. And that's why I work at Social Advocates for Youth. So what I want to walk through today, because you've all read it, is Dr. Cotter's steps for leading change. And the first one is increasing urgency. <laughs> And you guys already know all of these, but I just have to say that one thing that the chapter didn't talk about and I want to point out is the thing at the bottom. After you take a community through change, you just have to keep doing it and doing it. It never stops. It's never like you can rest on your laurels and be done. Okay, everybody's happy now. Once you get through a massive change, as a leader, you're going to find something else to do. So your vacations will, you know, be limited. Um, the first one is increasing urgency. So tonight, 678 young people between the ages of 12 and 24 are going to sleep outside in our community. They're sleeping in cars. They're sleeping under bridges. Sometimes they're sleeping in tents. Um, I learned from one of the young men who uh, 
came to SAY, he told me that when he would bundle up for the night, he would take, uh, he actually was a student at the junior college, and at night he would take his tent and use it if he could, but sometimes he couldn't because the police would see the tent and then he'd get in trouble. So instead he would bundle up and he had all this gear that he you know, got on sale at places like REI or um, uh, thrift stores. So it was like outdoorsy gear. So it was really warm and waterproof. But the problem with a lot of that gear is that it also has reflective s stripes or stuff on it, right? If you're sleeping in a park, say it's a play structure, and you want to maybe sleep up at the top of the slide because it's dry up there, and you have all this reflective gear, when the police officer drives by, he'll see you. So he would cover up all that reflective parts of his, all of the reflective stripes and stuff with tape, packing tape, like black packing tape so that the cops wouldn't see him so he could try to get a few hours of sleep. It had never occurred to me that he would need to do that. Um, one of the young men we worked with, he told me how one day he woke up and he had frost actually in his beard. His, his beard was frozen. And the thing that's crazy is there's a good percentage of these young people that are actually your classmates. And maybe even some of you who've gone through this. We know that looking at the number of youth we have homeless in our community, it, that means in every single classroom in our county, there's at least one young person who's experienced homelessness. Now, 678 sounds like a lot, but two years ago, it was even bigger. Or I guess it's three years now. In 2013, we had 1,128 young people sleeping outside every night. Kind of going back to what Mr. Emanuel said, you never want to let a good crisis go to waste. SAY has a shelter, and we have a housing community. We have apartments that young people can rent, and we've been working with homeless youth for 45 years. For us to learn that there were 1,128 young people homeless, that was a punch in the gut. And I think I see some of you checking out your phones. I'm going to request that you stop doing that. You don't have too much longer with me, I promise. Um, Unless you're posting this, I mean, come on. Um, anyway, so this was, this was our moment. This was a moment for our agency to say, we have to do something about this. We can't stand by, as the leading agency that serves homeless young people in our county, we can't stand by and say this 1,100 youth is okay. So if you want to create change, you grab a hold of that. And then you have to look at building the guiding team. We couldn't do this alone. Just like Mariah or Joshua, if they were going to go forward with their plans about getting water in the community, they would have had to get a bunch of you on board and maybe form a committee and then get everybody else on board. So that's what we did. At Social Advocates for Youth back in 2013, we talked to our friends. We talked to our donors. And so each year our agency takes about $7 million to run. In 2013, it was about a $4 million agency, so a little bit smaller. But still, that's a lot of people that donate. We talked to our board of directors, our advocates, people who would stand up for us at city council. And probably most, of all, most importantly, we talked to our youth, the young people themselves who were sleeping outside. We said, what do we need to do to make this 1128 go down? And they all said, we need more housing. And if you follow city council, this is a huge issue right now with the Santa Rosa city council, the Healdsburg city council, the Sonoma city council. Down in San Rafael, it's a huge issue. There is a huge housing shortage here in our community. But they said, we need more housing for youth. And so we thought, well, OK, then we'll get some more housing for youth. But we didn't really know what to do. So we traveled around the country. And this is step two of Cotter's leading change. Or is it step three? I skipped one. Oh, get the vision right. Yeah, OK, that's step three. So, what you want to do is figure out what it is you're trying to push. Because you could say, oh, I want to get running water, right? But that actually is really vague. So one is increase urgency. Two is build the guiding team. Three is get your vision right. So what we did is we traveled to Los Angeles. We traveled to San Francisco. We went up to Seattle and Portland. We went to North Carolina, Tennessee, Washington, D.C., and Michigan. And we visited a number of organizations that already had more housing for youth. And they'd created this kind of campus atmosphere. And it was really cool. So then we thought, well, we either have to build this, or is there a structure that already exists? And one of our supporters said, hey, 
what about that old hospital on the corner of Summerfield and Hohen? And this is an old hospital. It used to be called the Warwick Hospital. Are any of you familiar with the Warwick Hospital? Some of you might have been born there. Okay. So it's a big hospital. It's 58,000 square feet. It's a large hospital. And it had been sitting vacant since 2008. So we, uh, we checked it out. We didn't know what it was going to be. But we were walking through these halls. And I'll tell you, it was room after room after room. Empty. Some of them had beds in them. And we had kids literally dying outside. We were so excited that this might be the thing that we could do for these young people. And then that excitement was tampered by the fact that the roof was like Swiss cheese, and we knew there was asbestos and mildew in the walls, and it was a mess, and it would take a lot of money and a lot of work to make this thing happen. But we were committed to it at this point. We thought, this is it. This is our vision. It wasn't quite our vision. Let me tell you, the getting the vision right is something that, kind of like spending that six months I did in Peace Corps, takes forever, and it should. It should take the longest amount of time, because you need to get a lot of feedback from your stakeholders. And one of the first things that's, that's good to do to get people excited is to be bold. One of the things that inspired me through this was that in New Orleans, the mayor said, we're going to end homelessness for veterans. And then in one year, they did it. If New Orleans can end homelessness for veterans, why can't we build a youth campus with housing for our homeless youth and end homeless youth in Sonoma County? It's exciting, right? How can you not get behind something like this? So we came up with the idea that we could take this hospital and we'd turn it into a housing for 100 youth and we'd put jobs programs in it and we'd, we'd have a cafe where kids could learn culinary arts and we'd have counseling programs and do everything that we do now, which are those three things, and they are housing, counseling, jobs. Okay, you're going to get better as the day goes on. Um, we thought we'll do the things we do now, but here and more and better. And so we came up with a map, and we were like, look what we're going to do. Isn't this cool? And this is only part of the building. This is only 50 or 32,000 square feet of it. Um, and we, so we were saying, we're going to put in affordable housing, and we're going to put in emergency housing. We're going to have a way for these kids to take themselves out of this poverty that is often so cyclical that they, they got from their families that they maybe never even got from their families because they were foster kids, and they'll have an opportunity to create a new path for themselves. And then we went to the community and we said, this is what the Dream Center is. It's affordable housing. It's a place for kids to get on their feet. And then we got a lot of feedback. And it was so much feedback that I really wasn't prepared. We learned that even our, that our neighborhood around this building heard that we wanted to help at-risk you. And they freaked out. Because what do you think of when you think of at-risk youth or homeless youth? Not always the nicest things. And we hadn't really thought of it from their perspective. And then we heard from our youth even, and they were like, you want to put 100 people in one building? Are you crazy? I don't want to feel like I'm in a farm. So we had to take a step back. And we had to start making adjustments to our vision. Remember, we're still in getting the vision right. We haven't even gotten to the other five steps yet. And so that meant changing a few things. So we said, okay, well, we're going to increase the operations over time. How does that feel, you who are going to live here and neighborhood around it, around it? And they said, oh, that feels much better. And so then we started to get feedback from these same neighbors that was incredibly negative. And some of them actually, before we had the opportunity to talk to the neighbors, they took it upon themselves and printed up flyers that were absolutely incorrect. And they put them around the neighborhood, trying to stir up controversy in not having us there. So they said things like that this was going to be a rehab center, or that we were going to bring kids in from out of town that were criminals, or that all of our young people were criminals. And personally, this was really hard for me. And I thought, how, can you, how could you do this? And then I got to this point where I was like, how can I do this? How can I go into this room, sometimes this big, with standing room only, and people yelling, saying they didn't want us, 
They didn't want us to help our kids in their neighborhood. And there were even points where they were telling me personally that I was a liar and I was ruining our community. And our CEO went through this and our board of directors. And I was heartbroken. Because remember, I'm that idealist big bird. And I really wanted to help. And I couldn't believe this was happening. And I had to take a step back and realize that it's about getting people on board and it's about education. These folks haven't met our kids yet. They don't know them. They don't know what we do. They don't know that our programs work and that 87% of the kids that lived at SAY last year moved into their own housing, that 200 of our youth got jobs. They don't know that yet. So we have to share it with them. So we had to say things like, well, the Dream Center is not a drug treatment center or a soup kitchen. We had to come out and say that instead of saying, this is what it is. And that was helpful. We incorporated so much community feedback that it shifted the vision of the project so that not only would we meet the needs of our youth, but also the desires of our neighbors. And I, I say that very, very specifically. The needs of our youth had to be met first, and then the desires of our neighbors. Because we're here to serve youth who need us, who, when they need us the most. That is our mission. So we incorporated a lot of feedback. And some of these things were about the size of the property I mentioned. We shrunk it from 100 down to 63 youth living there each night. We're still going to serve about 1,000 kids a year coming through the doors for workshops on job readiness and stuff like that and counseling. But living there each night, we recognized even the building couldn't handle 100 youth. So we had to be a little bit more realistic. And there was a lot of concern about property values. And so we had to do our research and learn that University of Albany, New York did a study about property values and how they're not actually affected when a program like this is put into a neighborhood. And again, we went to those people that had done this before and looked to them for support, and that was super helpful. Because of time, I'm not going to get into all of the concerns we were able to address, but it did involve a lot of conversations. And that part lasted about a year and a half. And then we had a vision. And then we told everybody about it. Our youth spoke at the JC Board of Trustees, at the City Councils, the Board of Supervisors. We came everywhere we could, every Rotary Club, Kiwanis Club. We did the circuit. We told everyone what we wanted to do. There were a lot of great um, newspaper articles written about this possibility. That we were taking this old community asset, this hospital that was no longer in use, we were going to turn it into something that could be used for youth who need it the most. That's the fourth step. Communicate it. Because you want to get buy-in from everybody. And all along the way, there were still folks who were like, yeah, I don't want you in my neighborhood. And we were still having those conversations every week. Our leadership at SAY was constantly engaged in that. Because those were the people who didn't know our youth and needed to. And blowing them off would have been the worst thing we could have done. The fifth step for Cotter, and in, in terms of change leadership, is empowering action. And this sometimes feels like a chore, because what you as a leader needs to do is take away all the obstacles that could possibly exist for getting people who aren't you involved. So if I were to ask you folks to, do, to come to a rally, and I wasn't really clear on when it was or what you were going to do, then I'm not really making it easy. But if you come and I tell you specifically that you, know, you get to hold this sign and you have to stand up here with these people, and it's super organized and you are invested in it, then people come. So you have to empower people to do that, to get excited about it, to really own it. Because then it's not just you know, Mariah's project that you're helping out with. It's your project. Bless you. And then what happens after you start doing that, people start doing things on their own and they get excited on their own and things happen and you're like, oh my gosh, this whole community loves these kids and you get super excited and energized and you forget about the heartache you felt earlier that year when you were going up against people who didn't like the project. That may have been me. Um, and you have these wins. And this is for anything you do in life. You want to create short-term wins. Because if you're working for four years, for example, toward a specific goal, for example, at a specific place, and you just slog through it, it seems exhausting. But if you celebrate along the way, it makes it seem more reasonable, and it makes it seem more fun. 
So for the community that's engaged and showing up and empowered, having them win something, having them achieve something, like getting the planning commission to unanimously approve of this project, that was huge. And this community helped participate in it. This is actually a photograph of one of the rallies, uh, not rallies, one of the co uh, community meetings we had where um, SAY would present the project and then we would take questions. It's a mandated meeting by the city. Um, yeah. Thank you. And so this meeting, all of these folks in the yellow shirts, they said, say yes to dreams. Because we were calling it the Dream Center. And they came out in support of our kids. And then there were folks who were there and they were curious. And then there were folks who were staunchly opposed to the project. But at the end of that, some, not too long afterwards, we did get the full public approval of the um, city planning, or yeah, the planning commission. And that was a short-term win that we were so excited about, because that then propelled us to the next thing. And along the way, while we were getting to that next thing, the seventh step is don't let up. You have to maintain momentum, which means you have to take care of yourself, make sure you're getting enough sleep and eating. It also needs to make, you need to make sure that you're taking care of your team and that your team is taking care of you. You're holding each other up because that momentum is key to success. And then, and this is actually a photo of a prayer vigil. Uh, this was a funny prayer vigil, and we're, in, we're a nonprofit that doesn't have any religious affiliation, but the neighbors uh, that were religious, and then there were several churches and stuff around that, uh, the Dream Center, got together, they said, we want to do a prayer vigil for this to get approved by city council. And we're like, okay. I mean, we can't lead it, but you guys can. So they came, and it was the um, Bennett Valley Buddhists who knew that they were there, uh, a couple Methodist churches, um, and a couple synagogues. All came out. And so this is, again, we empowered this group. It was awesome. And then you make change stick. That's the eighth step. This is a photo of the city council giving full unanimous approval to the Dream Center project moving forward, which was about two and a half years after the dream even came into our heads. And I'm really excited that last year we broke ground and we started raising funds to build the dream center. <coughs> and uh, in 14 months, that same group of stakeholders that I talked about in step two, when you get your guiding team together, that same group helped us raise $9.8 million to build this building. And tonight, 12 kids are moving in, actually, yesterday and today. And they are sleeping there, because they're, and they're off the streets because of these people. Last week, <laughs> by the end of this month, 40 young people will be sleeping there every night. We've already had over 300 young people come through the doors for work, re work readiness workshops and counseling. The dream came real. And we would not have been able to do this had we rushed, had we not listened, had we skipped that important, incredibly important doing nothing part. I want to leave you with this quote by Dr. John Cotter, who is the one who wrote these eight steps that you are now familiar with because you all read your chapter. Um, management is about coping with complexity. Leadership is about coping with change. So a manager can see many moving parts and keep things going. And a leader is going to look at where we are and where we need to be and how we need to get there. And the two can be the same. One person can be a manager and a leader. But it's important to recognize the difference. And hopefully these tools that Cotter wrote down will help you do that. I don't know if I have any time left. I have time left if there's any questions about anything. The project, youth homelessness. Yeah. We do have opportunities for people to get involved. I actually brought with me today some business cards. And on the back, it has information about how to volunteer if you're interested in that. And then one of the questions I often get asked is when you see someone who's on the streets that's homeless, what, um, what do you do? Do you give them food? Do you give them money? Do you ignore them? Most people do the latter. Most people ignore homeless people on the street. Um, you guys are stuck here for like five more minutes. You just put your things down. Chill out. <laughs> um, most people do because it's awkward, right? I find it awkward. And I work with homeless people for a living. 
And so um, if you're interested at SAY, if you see someone who's youngish looking, and by youngish, I mean, oh, they look about under 30, um, we have these things, they're outreach cards, and it has what we can help them with, our hotline, and a little map on the back. So that way they can find us. We have a drop-in center downtown. Um, so that's another thing. But we do have volunteer opportunities as well as opportunities to help out with our fundraisers and things like that. So um, any other questions? Yeah, Moran. From 2009 to 2011, it seemed like there was a plate and it's saving things by mm -hmm. That's a great question. So Mariah asked, from 2009 to 2011, there actually was a 168% increase in youth homelessness in our community. And I think there could probably be many reasons for this, but I'm going to name two today. Um, one, 2009 was, you know, the end of the recession. And so we were coming out of a really difficult time for families that may have been already on the brink, that they were just falling apart during. So if a family was barely holding it together, if they were barely keeping their job, if they were barely keeping their unruly teenager together, and then the recession hits, that makes a lot fall apart. So you start to see a lot more runaways and you start to see a lot more young people getting kicked out. We also have um, a terribly low vacancy rate. Here in our community, we have a 1.4% vacancy rate, which is pretty much nothing. Meaning if somebody has enough money, they have a hard time finding a place to live. And so imagine working a minimum wage paying job full time. You actually, according to the California Budget Project, still can't afford to live here. So those are two of the main reasons I can name. There are other factors, but they're not unique to our area. But that housing crisis issue is. And the other thing I want to point out is that the number of homeless youth here even when it was 1,100 youth versus today's just under 700 youth, over 85% of them are from here. So it's not that we're, at, we're bringing in people because, oh, we have the Dream Center, it's bringing in homeless people. They actually are from here. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Do you guys have a follow-up program? Like, say you're no longer considered youth, what do you do with that That's a great question. Um, so we have... One of the, the challenges with nonprofit funding is we often are not funded to do aftercare. We currently receive two federal grants that allow us to do aftercare, meaning we can follow up and check in on a young person after they leave us. So um, that does give us some opportunity. A lot of our young people kind of come back and give back, uh, but we're not, we don't have enough capability, or, meaning staff, to reach out to the young people on a consistent basis. So often what they do is they leave, they graduate from the program, and we have really good success rates, um, and maybe we'll keep in touch with them for about a year, and then after that we may or may not hear from them, but it's pretty much anecdotally. One of the exciting things at SAY is that we're going to start a pilot project at the Dream Center this fall that will allow us to do more of that aftercare. Any other questions? No, oh, there we go. That's an awesome question too. Um, so. They, it depends. So we have short-term housing, which is six months. They can stay up to 180 days. Most of them are like two, three months because they then they move out of that. It's like, a, it's like one big room with 12 people sleeping in it, so it's not the most comfortable thing. Um, so they move out of that fairly quickly. Our teen shelter, which is for minors age 12 to 17, are there for a maximum of 21 days. Their average stay there is about a week. Our goal at the teen shelter is to reunify them with their family as long as it's safe to do so. That's where a lot of aftercare counseling comes into play. For the longer term housing, um, it can, it's, I would say the average used to be about a year. Now because of the housing crisis, we're looking at about two years. Um, but technically it can be from the age 18 to 24. Most of them kind of get sick of it, just kind of like you guys get sick of living in the dorms. After a while, you're ready for your own space. So it's very similar. All right, how am I for time now? You quit? You quit? <laughs> I think, is that it then? All right, I think I'm done. Thank you.